Welcome back to our coach webinar series. This week's webinar is creating a performance analysis template for coaches with Thomas Mount. Thomas is currently GDA with Westmead GEA and also performance analysis with Westmead Senior Camogie and Senior Football Teams. Have your pen and paper close by and enjoy the learning. Thanks many for that night. So today what we're going to do is we're going to create an analysis template for coaches. So the analysis template is going to be based off a coach's coaching philosophy. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at how a coach's philosophy can influence an analysis template. Okay. So the five steps that I use for creating a template are the first thing is I plan them. So the first thing I do is I get a piece of paper. When I say plan, it's very rough. It's get a piece of paper, start writing down the ideas of what I want. Okay. So for example, I might be looking at puckouts and I might be looking at what do I want in puckouts. So I start writing down little ideas start playing around with different ideas I have and start, how do I put them all in one template, okay? So from there, I might have my few things I want to look at. Then I create my template. So how I might create that is I'll just do a piece of paper to start off roughly. What I'll do is then put the bits together in the template, see how it looks, see is it easy for me to read, okay? The third thing I do is I pick any old game off TV. Okay, I'll go onto YouTube, I'll find an old Komogi game, practice it, all right? At this stage, what I usually find is that maybe I've left something out that I think is important, okay? Maybe I've left something out that means that I couldn't get a true picture in that game. So that's where it comes to step four is when I'm adapting my template. So from what I've learned from my practice, I'm now adapting the template, okay? And adapting it so that it works for me, okay? That when I'm practicing, I'm getting everything into my template that I'm looking for. Okay, so that's where my adaption comes in. Some cases, I might have too much in my template that when I practice, I'm not getting everything in there and I can't get everything done correctly. My uh, reliability has gone down. So what I'll do there is I'll adapt it, I'll take some stuff out, and then what I'll do is I'll develop that template. Okay, so I can put it into Publisher or Excel or any of the things we'll talk about later on in, the, in this presentation. So even at that point, after we've developed it, there's nearly two steps to our development. Okay, the first step is we develop the template that we can use for games. What you might find in six months' time is you might redevelop that template. So what you might do is in six months' time, you're getting used to your template. You're getting used to the information you're creating with your template. So what we do at that stage is we might actually be able to go back in and change it up and put in something extra. So we might find that from puck outs, we're just looking at puck outs won and lost. But when we're watching the games, like we're looking, going, right, okay, what's actually coming off these puck outs we won? So there at that stage, we might redevelop our template and put in what's coming off the puck outs we won. Let it be short, let it be long puck outs. So that's giving us that extra layer of detail. So there are the five steps that I use for creating templates. The first step, again, just to recap, is plan it. Usually that on a rough piece of paper. Sit down, put my ideas down. Then I kind of create a rough template that I can use to just practice a game. Again, step three is the practice phase. So when I put in that, when I'm practicing, when I have that rough template done, I'm practicing it, using an old game off YouTube. Then from my learnings from that before it's match ready to use or live ready to use, I adapt it. So I go in and make the change that I feel will then have me ready to use live again. At this stage, you can practice it again. We can develop that then into our main template. And then from there, when we're comfortable in a couple of months time, we can develop that again or redevelop that again to add in more detail when we're feeling comfortable. Okay, so there are my five steps to creating a template. So the big question is, what are we going to track? Okay, the one piece of advice I've given this is less is more. All right, really important. When we go back into that planning phase, we could have 10, 11, 12 things we want to track. Where I'm, when I'm doing analysis, I'm doing a live, I like to look at six things. Okay, I try and break them down to three on the ball, three off the ball. Okay, so that when I'm, I'm not having six things I'm looking for when we're on the ball. Because by that way, it's, it's hard to track everything. Okay, you're trying to keep up with the game. You don't want to be missing events. So you want the message to be true and consistent and, and real. And if we're tracking too much, our message becomes diluted because it's not going to be 100% right. So this is why I always say less is more. When I'm talking about on the ball and off the ball events, I'm looking at what we're doing in possession, okay? So, for example, first one, 
hookouts. That's an on the ball event, okay? A shooting, on the ball event, okay? Maybe our attack entries, on the ball event. Or even maybe our passing, again, on the ball events. An off the ball event would be what we're doing when we're defending. So our foul count, okay? Our hooks and block count. Who's making our hooks and blocks? So they're the aspects we're looking at off the ball. In some cases, we might look at what the opposition are doing. So again, that would be an off the ball, that would be an off the ball event to track. So that's where we talk about on the ball and off the ball. Again, I usually try to focus to six, okay, three on the ball, three off the ball. It just means that it gives us a constant flow and we're not tracking too much of one area. So we can focus on them three, then three on the ball areas and three off the ball areas. And it's not going to become too much for us in starting off. Okay, so I suppose that leads us on to nicely our next bit. How do we pick them six things? Okay, so when we start doing creating our templates, we're all going to have 15, 20 things we want to track. We want to know everything we can. So how are we going to whittle that down to six? So the big thing I feel is we need to do is do a needs analysis. Okay, so how do we decide what to track? So we see here we've got our five areas. So our first thing is our variables, okay? By doing this first step, that will whittle this 15 down very quickly. So what is critical to success? So when we talk about the coach's philosophy, how or what is important to a coach for their team to be successful, okay? So if we think of Cork, they're a possession team, a possession-based team. Their variables or what's important to them is going to be different than what's important to Kilkenny, for example. Okay, who might be looking for quick ball into the forward line, whereas Cork might be about possession. So here, what we look at here is what's critical to them teams. It's not what's critical to our opposition. It's what's critical to our success. Okay, is it having a high hook and block count? Is it having a huge return on our own puckouts? Okay, so here, the 15 things we might talk about earlier on needing this is where we whittle down to six the six most important things which are critical for our team to be successful okay then the next part is how could they be recorded reliably so again that comes back into what we were talking about earlier so how could they be recorded reliably so that's back to our planning phase how can i put these six critical things to our success and be able to record them reliably okay so again, that comes down to our planning phase, how we design our template. Do I need to do it in a pitch? How are we going to do it? Okay, so we'll talk about that later on. But there are the two first questions to ask yourself. Which of my 15 are critical to success? And then I get my thinking cap on. How can I record these reliably? The next step, depth and detail. Are we going to go with individual or team-based stats? Okay, some coaches like looking at the individual players during the game. Why would you like that? Well, it might give the, it gives them an idea of who's going well or where the team is going strong. Okay, so for example, you might have 15. We always talk about the corner four being the first person taken off. But if we're looking at individual stats there, we might see that they've had five possessions. They might have got two scores and two assists. So out of their five possessions, they've been involved in four scores for us. So for here, in that sense, that's given us a great message. That's given us Right, that player's had five players. Instead of taking that player off, is there a way we can get that player more into the game? Okay, so that's where we might look at our individual stats. Or we flip that and look at our team-based stats, which we've talked about already, our puck outs, our hook and block counts as a team instead of an individual. Okay, again, each coach will have their own preference on this. There's no right or wrong answer. Some coaches would prefer individual, so it gives them, paints them a picture of how the players are going. Some teams will prefer team-based stuff, or some coaches prefer team-based stuff so they know how the team is going. Okay? What level of detail are we going to go into? So we talked about earlier on with the puck outs. Are we looking at puck outs and just looking at the puck out being won or lost? Or are we going to look at who won it? Where they won it? What came from the puck out? So that's where we have to decide, okay, we have the puck out, but what level of detail are we going to go into? Are we happy with that kind of one-dimensional information where we get that we won the puck out? Or now we're going to look at who won the puck out, where they won it, what came from it. Okay. 
Again, the trade-off from that is how can that be done reliably going into that depth, okay? Feedback. So the third step of deciding what to track. How much feedback are we going to give? So when we're looking at our depth and detail, that's going to come into our feedback, okay? If we're giving that live journey again to the coach, how long, how much feedback or how much time have we got to give feedback to the coach? At half time, we could only have 40 to 60 seconds to give that feedback to the coach. So are they going to want a load of information or are they going to want the key points from that first half? If it's during the game, well, how are we going to give them feedback? Is it going to be 10 seconds? We've probably got a 10 to 15 second window live in the game to give that feedback back to our coach. So it has to be specific. They don't want us telling them a story. They want 15s after getting four scores from when our number two is picking her up. Okay? Specific information like that. They're really hurting us through that right channel. Okay? So again, that comes back to the depth or the detail where you want to go into. Does the coach only want specific messages? We've lost six pokeouts. Or does he want, we've lost five pokeouts short and we've got four scores off that. So that's what we have to look at. Okay? Again, we have to look at, is this template we're creating for live purposes, for during the game, or are we going to use this after the game to create a picture? Okay, if it's live during the game, feedback might need to be a specific. It might just need to be our short message like we talked about. Whereas afterwards, it could paint a bigger picture for us. It could be used to give our, our feedback on our match on a Monday night at training session or a review of our match. Okay, so that's where we come into our time frame. So when we're going to deliver this, when are we going to deliver our analysis back to the players, the team, the manager, okay? Based off that, that will tell us how much we can, or what depth we can go into our analysis. So if we look at our time frame. If it's post-game, we can go into more detail. Whereas as we've, as we've discussed already, if it's live, we can't really go into as much detail because we've got that shorter window. So again, our templates reflect that, okay? We, have, we can have two templates, a template for post-game, which can go into more depth so we can find more answers to the questions we'll have, okay? Whereas the live one would have to be specific to what, we're, what is critical to us to be successful. The last thing to think about when you're creating your template is the resources you have available, okay? The most important thing that I always talk about is having a four-color pen. A four-color pen gives us four ways of coding or marking things. Okay, hugely important. Just having that four color pen gives us four more layers of detail very quickly. Okay, be able to be able to color code things, which we'll again show later on. But again, it's an easy way for us to get more information to our coaches and to our team. Again, the other resource we have to look at are we using pen and paper? Are we going to have the video available to us after the game? If we don't have video after the game, the only stats we have are lives. We have to make sure they're reliable, first of all. And we have to talk, think about what are they going to be used for after the game to do our post-match reviews. Okay, again, do we have computer software? Have we just pen and paper? Okay, all of these questions have to come into it. If we have pen and paper available to us, then it's going to be our template we need to come up with. Our template then, is that going to be used live? Is it going to be used post-game? So again, we have all these questions to ask, answer. Again, these are all questions for a manager to, cut, to, to answer. It's not for anyone else to answer for you. Okay, so the coach yourself will know what resources you have available to them. Have you got four people available to you who are going to do analysis with, for you? Or have you got one person? So depending on what way it is you have, or depending on what way it is, what resources you have available to us, that's going to be, that's going to make up our template. Okay, or what we can track. Okay, so that's the steps I go through next after right now or plan out your template, go through this needs analysis phase. So what can we record? In our templates, what can we record? So we have the who, the what, the when, and the where. So who done it? So which player done it? Where did it? Is? So what location on the pitch did it? Okay, was it the left half forward position? Was it on the 40? Okay, what location did they do it? What did they do? So did they win, was a player 10 won a puck out on our own 65? And when they did it? So they're the four actions to look at, or the four actions we can record. 
Now it's very hard to create a template that has all four of these. Okay, so what we sometimes say is if we get two, three, two or three of them in, we're doing really well. This is the extra layers of the data we talked about earlier on. So when we talked earlier about having our one layer template or one layer data, so our puck out being one, that's our action. Okay, our second layer might be who would want it. Our third action might be, our third layer might be where they want the puck out. So that's where we're here, we have our action, our player location and time. So that's giving us them extra layers of data. By tracking the time, it could give us, we could see how we're getting on the last 10 minutes of games. That could tell us our own story. Okay, so I look at player location and action, and I'd say most analysts find themselves looking at that. But that's not saying that time doesn't give us great information. Okay, time gives us a completely different layer of information. It shows us how we're doing at certain periods of the game. And especially now, since COVID, time is actually playing a huge factor in the game if you break it down to the four quarters. So again, a lot of teams now post-COVID have actually brought time into it, how they're doing at each four quarters. Okay, so I'd say post -COVID, before COVID, action, player, and location were the three big ones I was looking at. But now, I suppose, since post-COVID, time has come a lot into it, breaking the game down by the quarters and how we're doing in each quarter. So... We've talked about how we create templates. What I'm going to, the four tools that I use to create my templates once I've practiced them and planned them, uh, the three tools I use to create them then are Excel, Publish, and Word. Again, the great thing I love about these three products, they're free, they're easy, accessible, and there's enough workshops or videos online on how we can create stuff in them. Okay. Again, going through this template or going through the next phase of this PowerPoint or webinar. I'm going to show you once I've created in Excel, PowerPoint and Word. So again, they're easy to use, they're free, and they give us, we can create them in our way that suit us. So it gives us that flexibility to create our own stuff. Now, some people might do them in Adobe. Perfect. I just use the three free products that I know. So design a notation system. So now we know what we're going to track. It's how do we, how do we track these in the game? So how are we going to create a notation system? To track these. So the three main types of systems we can create are a scatter diagram, a frequency table, or a sequential system. So we're going to go through all three of these now, okay? We've seen probably examples of all three of these before. So it's not going to be new to us. It's how we design these to suit our own coaching philosophy, okay? So scatter diagrams are usually simple. They gather information in an event and enable immediate feedback. So we just see here, this is just a possession chart from a game we looked at. So the blue dots are all ones from possession or possessions from play, and the yellow ones are possessions from freeze. So these were just looking at specific players where they had the possession in the second half. So what that gives us is when we compared that to the first half map for this one, we seen that all the possessions were in our own half. Whereas in the second half, they were further up the pitch. So again, the great thing about this is it's easy for us to see the pattern, okay? We can see where they're getting possessions. We can see the trends developing within the possessions using this scatter diagram. It's an easy one for, say if a coach's vision, they like to get their message across visually. That's very easy for us to hand to a coach and go, this is where Six has had all his possession or her possessions. So we can look at that then and we could see where they're having their possessions or where the team are having possessions. Okay, and it's very easy for the coach to paint the picture then. We might see that all our possessions in the forward line are right through the middle. We're not keeping the game wide. So it's very easy to draw them conclusions for us. The downside to this is that you can only track a specific amount of information. So here I could only track possessions. I couldn't change the chart up and go, right, I want to look at puck outs within this. There are, you have to have a separate chart for everything. So again, you could be carrying on lots of pieces of paper. So again, it's if I'm looking at one stiff area, if I think that one stiff area is critical to our success, then this is a great way of showing it, especially if our coach is visual. Okay. Again, the next one we'll have a look at is we'll have a little sample of a puck out chart. So the ticks are puck outs one and the X is a puck outs lost. So we're the team here are playing left to right. So again, very easily here we look at this. There's a lot of there's a lot of patterns we can easily see in this. So we can see the 11s won five puckouts, three in the left, one on the right, and one in the middle. 
So as a coach or as an analyst going to a coach or whoever's doing your analysis for you or giving you information, you can easily see here, okay, when we hit 11, we're getting success out of that. We won five out of five. And we can also see where he's popping up or where she's popping up. She popped up in three different positions first. Is she moving around the pitch doing puck outs? Okay. So are we doing a little Roman tactic? Is that working? If this was an opposition team, you can easily look at going, okay, is 11 moving around? Who's picking her up? Do we need to go man on man for this puck out against her? Do we need to have her man marked for puck outs that wherever she goes, someone follows her? Again, that's giving us great information as a coach. So during the game as a coach, we're getting this information that 11's won four out four on our puck outs. We can then go pick, have a look at her next puck out. Is she picking up different positions? Is she being lost in the crossover? So again, that's really vital information for us as a coach to know during the game. Again, our second layer off that data we talked about earlier, we could put a little line underneath that and see if a score comes off them puck outs. Again, little things we can look at from using our scatter diagram. We could see that 12 has lost three out of three or puck outs lost. So we know we're doing a good job on her. Okay, we can see the distance of the puck outs. We can see they're all around that between the 65 and 45 mark. We see that there's the two long ones. But we see there's a kind of bit of a pattern developing there between the 65 and 45. And we can also see that they've won four out of four of the long puck outs to the left. So again, for us as coaches, we can start saying, okay, that's where they're favoring. Do we need to make a tactical change there? Do we need to bring the right half forward further back? Do we need to put our strong ball winners on that side of the pitch? So again, from using this scatter diagram, it's given us great information as a coach. If we're given this as a coach during the game, it's easy to see that pattern as well. And it's easy for the analyst if we're just looking at puck outs. So during what we say, the non-possession phase or the three off the ball things, during the off the ball phase, if this is all worth using, we can then study that and have a look and go, okay, we see 11 parts. We see 12 parts. We see where the puck outs are going. So we can base the line off that, our defensive line off that. So it starts giving us a load of little pictures we can start using. And as we can see here, it's easy for us to understand. Okay. The only downside with scatter, or scatter diagrams is you can't put a lot of information on it. It's only looking at puck outs or in the previous chart, it's only looking at possessions. Again, how do I create this? I literally just put it, go onto Google, type in, GEA pitch, save the image. I go into Publisher, open up a, a document in Publisher, turn the landscape to, or turn the portrait to landscape, put the pitch in, stretch it out, and then I just press print. And then again, I use my four color pen. So the great thing with having this is you could look at both teams. You could look at our puck opposition, notate our puck outs, red can notate the opposition. So on the same page or same sheet, we're getting the two teams' puck outs. And it's quite easy for us still to dif differentiate between both teams. So again, all that information we just have for our own team, we could have that for the opp opposition team as well. Okay. The next template we can create is a frequency table. Our next notation system we can create is a frequency table. Frequency tables are commonly used. I'd say most of us have probably seen them in some form when we're doing analysis. They are very simple to use and create and give easy information to understand. So the great thing about a frequency table is we might have to do a bit of searching into the scatter diagrams to get our information, but the frequency tables are all there in front of us. Okay, it's very easy for us to turn around and go, we've won four out of five puck outs. It's all there in front of us. Whereas in the scatter diagram, we'd have to do a count. Whereas the frequency table, very easy for us to see it. The downside of, it, of frequency tables it's usually that one-dimensional data we talked about earlier. So we're usually just looking at the event. We're not really getting an opportunity to look at where, so the location, the who, the player that done it, or the time. It's usually very one-dimensional. Again, we can look at a player-based one for individual stats where we could bring in our player and our event. But again, it's very one-dimensional. We're not getting that second layer of information we talked about. So we see here, this is just a simple one that's been created. So we'll see here, the top we have the date and who we're against. On the left, 
here in the in the peachy type color that's all team a's data or analysis for example and on the purple or gray side that's all the opposition stuff so we'll see here this is just an easy uh, template which i'll give to Niall to share out with you afterwards so again here just team a we're looking at the outcome of the puck out so we have short and long so we have the location as such but again it's not an exact location it's a short and long we have to then define them as a, for ourselves as a coach okay so we see here the short puck out we'll have the outcome from the first half and what we got off it so here at the half time we can just put in quite easily four out of five short we won and along we might have won six out of twelve okay we'll be able to see that we got three scores off our short puck outs and we might got four off our long so we have a bit of a decision there to make all right we have the same information on the right hand side then for our opposition in the middle we have our attacks so the attack we define in Kamoi is inside the opposition's 45 okay so which side are they coming into are they attacking from are they attacking from the left the middle the right again with that when we're marking it we could put a little mark underneath if they end up in a score so now we're looking at they might have had 20 attacks from the left but only two of them have turned into scores Whereas the six times they've gone down the right side, five of them have got, got scores off. So again, we're trying to get as much information out of this template as we can. Again, we're looking at our shot stat. So we see here it says team A in opposition underneath that. That's our shot stat. So we have our points, our goals, our wide, our shorts, and our save. Quite easily, again, to look at our shots from play and our shots from freeze. Blue can take play, green can take a free. So again, that four color pens giving us that extra layer data. So now we can have our blue shots coming from play, our green ones coming from freeze, and then at the end of the game, we can see what we've been successful from play and what was successful from freeze. We see down here that that's notating the TT for me is just tackle turnover. So anytime we dispossess the opposition in a tackle under pressure, that could easily just be turnovers, and we could mark turnovers. The only thing I liked about the tackle turnover, the reason I had this in it was shown under pressure it was bringing our hooks and blocks okay our fouls so we have inside and outside scoring area again here the blue ones could be us the red ones could be opposition so just try and get that information in and then in the right corner this is just something that we used a bit in club Komogi or in county Komogi was looking at key players from teams so you look at right going into the game who's the key players for me could be 8, 9, 11, 13, and 15 in this case. How many possessions are they getting? So again, every time they get in possession, we could just be a little tally chart. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Again, opposition-wise as well. What we're looking for here is just to see our influential players getting on the, into the game. We find is an influential player could play in corner forward, not getting many possessions of the ball. Coach doesn't see, doesn't know that. We're just going, just not getting into the game. And really, we look back at it, they might have had three possessions, the ball might have gone in there. So, us as a coach now, we're getting information that maybe it might be better off to bring that player out to the half forward line. We're seeing that 11, 9, and 8 getting a lot of possessions there. It might be worth bringing 15 out there. The game's being played out there. Okay. So, again, we're just trying to create as much information as we can on what's critical for our team's success. So, again, these are very easy to create in Microsoft Excel. You're just using the lines that are there. So for us as a coach in this scenario, it's really us deciding what's important to us. We might think attack data is important to us, so we can change that and put in something else. Okay, we might want to see how many turnovers there are, how many hooks and blocks there are. There are. So that might be changed out of the turnovers. So the great thing about these are, it gives us our own chance to create what's important for us. Okay, when you look at your analysis sheet, you should be able to go, okay, that's a reflection of what I've been saying to the girls. This is how we want to play. So getting your picture or your pa painting your message across. So then at halftime, you can reinforce your messages. So again, scatter diagrams are easy to see and they're easy to have the information from. For tallying them up, they're quite easy to have your information at halftime or when the coach asks us, when we radio down to them or we're talking to them. The last system we'll go through today is our sequential system. The great thing about sequential systems is it gives coaches greater information at specific events. Similar to frequency tables, they're very easy to set up. 
The big disadvantage though are they're hard to interpret the information fast and in most cases it's hard to analyze more in one area again. So we're having the same issue there as we had with our scar diagrams that it's hard to do more in one area in these. All right. So with our scar diagrams, they give us, or secretion system, sorry, they give us great information. But what we're going to show in a minute is it's very hard for us to see the patterns. We nearly need two people doing this with us. One person looking at or noting the pattern, and another person checking out the data or the information. So I'm going to skip forward to this one first. This is just a sequence of plays. So how we do a sequential system is it's looking at a sequence of play. Okay, so it's looking at a sequence of events. So here we'll see six in the first, on the left hand side we have the possession. So which possession it was in the game. So this was the first time team A had the ball. And what happened in that sequence? So we see here we've TW, so turnover one by six. So each of the letters are equate, or have a, their own key code system. So the key code system is down the right here that I used. So P equals a point. G a goal, TW a turnover one, FW a free one, TL a turnover lost, POW puck out one, W a wide and S a short. And this is just looking for our team at the moment. So we'll see here in the first sequence. So turnover one, six, nine, and then 10 got a point. Okay, second one, nine won a puck out, 11. He gave the ball, she gave the ball to 11. 11 gave it to 15 and 15 got a goal from me. So we're going through these lists here and we're looking at what we have or what sequence have been shown us. So number the third sequence, again, turnover one by six, gave it to 14, 14 got a point. Okay. We skip down to number seven, for example. Seven, puck out one, pass to nine, nine to 10 and a point. So when we look through this, we're just seeing a load of numbers here in front of us. When we actually break it down, we see that the 9-10 combo. So 9 is giving the ball to 10 times, or 9 is giving the ball to 10 three times and got three points off. So we'll see sequence 1, point. Sequence 6, 9 to 10, point. Sequence 10, 9 to 10, point. Okay? Another thing we might see is 6, being involved in three scores there. Okay, so what picture is that telling us? So six involved in the first score, involved in the in the third score, or in the third sequence, and involved in the seventh sequence. And you'll see six there, one to turn over the first time, one to turn over the third time, and was the first pass off on the seventh sequence. So now we're seeing that maybe we're lamping ball down on six, okay? And six has been involved in three of their scores. So for us there, it's starting to paint that picture for us. The easy things we see, we might, it's very easy for us to look at the last player and go, okay, 10 has got three points here and one of three. So we'll see the 10 is one, the first play, sequence, the sixth sequence, the 10th sequence. So they have three points and they have the free one there as well. So we're starting to paint a picture here. So you can see here very quickly that the information we're getting from these sequential charts are vital to us. They're real life information. And there's stuff we could, that can make a difference in the game. Okay, if we look at them, analyze them three sequences that we just, them three patterns we just talked about, that 9 10 combo, our midfielders playing off their midfielders. Okay, is that where, is that causing us a problem? Do we need to mark up tight or a 9? Okay, are we loose on 10? How is 10 getting that space? So now we're getting them pictures or them problems we have to solve. Okay, that's six one, the sixth problem we're having. Six being involved in three scores, two of them want to turn over herself. So now is that that we're being turned over when we run through the middle? Or is it that we're hitting ball down the top for her and she's starting the attacks from? And we look at 10 again, we said that 10's got three points on a, on a free one. So are we marking 10 too loosely? So we can see in some cases the problem might be at the forward line where we're maybe hitting the ball down the top or maybe getting turned over, maybe letting them out too easy. Or a problem could be the other end. That we're not marking up tightly to certain players. So in my opinion, this gives us great information. Again, 
This one's just creating Excel. It can be creating a Microsoft Word either. I just leave the key code here beside us so I always know what I'm looking for. Again, in that white space there to the right hand side, you could be writing down your patterns. You could have six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, all marked down. And at certain times in the game, and just a pause in the game, you could just look through and go, okay, 10, three points, 15, goal, point, and a short. And start marking that in so we have that information and we can start seeing, okay, right, 10's got three points, pass that information on. Again, looking back, is it critical for to know this? Again, this comes into our individual player analysis that we talked about. So this would probably be more in, an individual one compared to our team-based one, okay? Here's another type of sequential system we have, okay? So here, we'd look at puckouts. So it's a sequential system for puckouts. Here what we're looking at, sorry. Here what we're looking at is the direction, the outcome, and the area for the puckouts. So we see here, the direction of the first pocket I have is a blue circle. So I just have a little blue circle on it so we could see the first one. Okay, so the direction of that puck out was left. The outcome was one, for example, in this one, and the areas. So we can break the pitch down to three areas. I just have them back, middle, and forward. So I'd have ending inside our own 65 as backs, between the two 65s in midfield, and 65 forward as forward. So again, they're my three areas. And then the who, so what player won it? So what we're looking at here is the direction, the outcome, the area. So again, as you can imagine, when this is filled out, it gives us, again, a load of information on puck outs. So we might start seeing that pattern. So our look for the sequential system is the pattern of what's happening. So what their sequential system is giving us is that pattern, so we can see what's happening. So we might see that they might have won 10 puck outs on the left side when number 10 won them. Okay, so now we're looking at going, okay, so left hand side in 10. Or that could be left and side of 14. So we're seeing the 14s coming out for puck outs maybe. So again, that gives us this information. Again, it's nice and easy to set up. Again, it's a table. You do this in Microsoft Word. You could do it in Excel, print it off, and then you just bring it, put it on your clipboard and circle it off again. You can have one for your own team and one for team B, or the opposition's team. Again, when you're going through this one, if you're just doing it for puck outs, it's a lot easier to have time to check the sequence because you'll have that natural break between puck out one and puck out two. They're not coming back to back to back. So again, it gives us that time to look for a pattern. So again, if puck outs are an important area for manager, this is a great way to get it. This and, this and the scatter diagram area are great ways to see the pattern. This gives us in the order of going. So quite easy, we could see puck out one went to 10, puck out two went to 12, puck out three went to 10, puck out four went to 12. So we're seeing the opposite. We could see even the direction might be opposite. Okay, we could see puck out one goes to the right, puck out two goes left, and again, that goes on and goes on, and we see that pattern developing. So again, depending on what the coach likes, the coach wants, this is a great system to get that information. Again, easy to set up and easy to use as well. Okay. So now we're kind of just talking about how we've how we have to create a template. So how does this all fit into our coaching process? So now we're after going to the athlete's ask performance. So this could be your training or your competition, your match, whatever it is. So the analysis is undertaken, step two. So now we're using our template to go through our analysis. Or we're using our template to conduct analysis of the game. Okay. The analysis then given us our our decisions or our knowledge or our information to make decisions. So our evaluation. So we can interpret and make decisions. Having that information or having the template done and the information gathered from the game makes our evaluation way more true and reflectful, way more meaningful because it's accurate. We know ourselves at times, we've said we've lost, we've got clean and puck outs. When we look back at the stats, the stats don't tell us that. Okay, so it's make let us giving us a chance to see that fair evaluation, make that fair evaluation. Okay, it's given us a better chance to make better decisions. Again, we always know the common one of 
the player playing in front of us either was playing better or worse than what sometimes we think because they're in front of us. Whereas the player at the far side could be having way more impact on the game. Because of the far side, we're not remembering that. Okay. So again, it's using our analysis to make correct decisions. Again, having our analysis allows us to have, be able to give correct and appropriate feedback. Okay. So again, our analysis is going back off our feedback. So we won our puckouts. We won eight out of ten puckouts that went left in that game. On the right hand side, we won four out of ten. What do you think we did well? Okay. Could be that we didn't get any breaks. Could be that number 10 on the left and said had a great game. Okay. They won a load of clean possession from puckouts. That feedback we can start giving. And it's true feedback. So again, players are able to take on these messages and it's building that trust between the players and the manager. Okay, because we have something factual to back it up with. And the great thing I love about NAS templates, which are created by the coach, it helps them in their planning. Okay, if I come in, do an analysis template that I use without meeting the manager, it doesn't really help the manager because that's what I think is important. Whereas when the manager sits down and creates his own template, it then helps with the planning. So again, if, the, if we're looking at things that are critical to a manager and we have this information on what a manager thinks is important, then from the game, he can start going, okay, right, we, we lost three pockets on that right-hand side. So now we want to work on that. We want to work on that. We have that information that we can work on. Okay? Because it's meaningful to the coach, the coach wants to improve that. So now we can start in that plan, right? We need to work on our shooting next week. We have a lot of shooting information there. Okay? Right, okay. How are we going to work on that? Right, the last game we've seen, we look at that, we use that from our sequential system. The last day we hit a lot of ball down at six. They got a lot of joy off that. They got three points off that. Okay, so now what are we going to be thinking? We're thinking of how our game plans evolve. So now we're using our information to base our trainings off that. So we're not just getting the analysis of during the game and getting rid of it. Okay, so that's where analysis fits into our coaching process. So as we can see, it's a big circle. So again, our planning then goes back to our athlete performing. So in this case, after game, we're planning out what we're doing with training. We go back and the athlete performs it in training. Okay, again, our analysis then is, how did that go? Right, how did we improve that training? Yeah, I think we started playing the ball a lot more into the corner. So our evaluation. Evaluation is, we moved the ball a lot better, we kept it away from six. The feedback should be, right, we'll play great ball out of the fence this time. We hit the corners very good. Okay, now we're looking at our feedback. We got five scores off when we hit the ball into the corners when we hit 15 or 13 instead of hitting it down top of 11. Okay? And then our planning goes forward again. So I hope that makes sense. That's how our coach, where our analysis comes into our coaching process. So, the next thing we're going to talk about is, now we have our information gathered from a game. We have all this great information. How are we going to deliver it to the players? Okay? So how are we going to deliver it? So we have different options and different times where we can deliver feedback. So the first step is during the game. So most of us are going to be creating a template that we can use during the game. For this, as a coach, whoever's doing the analysis or stats for you, you need to have a good relationship with them. You need to have trust between you and, say, the analyst or the stats person doing the stats for you to ensure the right message is being delivered. Okay? For you, the coach, you don't want to have every 10 seconds or every two minutes someone come over to you going, this is happening. You can see that. You're looking for that vital information which could change the game for you. Okay? So then we're talking about some cases my manager might only want, want critical information during a game. So there has to be an understanding of what is critical information. So it comes back to that relationship. The information that the analyst is giving you must be easy to process. Okay? Must be very easy for the coach to take on board. There's no point in us coming in and having a load of information going. Tens after getting the ball six times on the left-hand side. She struck it four times off her right side, two times off her left side. When she struck the four off her right side, two of them went to 15, two of them went to 13. Two of the ones went to 15 went over the bar, two of them went to 13 didn't go over the bar. For 10 of that, the coach is going to get bamboozled. 
Okay, so it's very important that that's a short message. Okay, Levens after getting the ball three times. Struck off a right three times. Okay, trying to hit 15. Okay, easy information, quick information. Again, when we flip that look at what the analyst and coach relationship, try to preempt what a coach might ask you during the game and ensure it's trackable. So, for example, or even in this situation, a coach, each game is going to call, have different problems. So, for example, if you're tracking what the opposition are doing, try to preempt what the coach might ask. Okay? If you have a game plan which 11 is very important for you, for your own team, preempt, okay, 11 is going to be one of the key players. Put that into our template. What's coming off 11? Is 11 getting into the game? So during the game, try and have your stuff preempted. So again, think about it. Think about before the game, what do I need to have for this game? Why is it specific to us being successful in this game? And try and have that information there. So again, it comes back to having a good coach and play or a good coach and analyst relationship. All right. Coach and analyst relationship, very important in this regard. During the game, make sure that the two you can trust each other that you can say what you need to be said, okay? Don't want to say too much what's critical to the manager. Understand who you're dealing with, okay? Again, as, a co as an analyst, in this sense, the last one, try to what a coach wants and make sure it's trackable. If it's not trackable, you're going to have to say it to coach forehand. Right? You're looking for something that's just not, I'm not going to be able to track during the game. Do you want me to just solely focus on that? Or do you want me to solely focus on what we've been tracking all year? Have that discussion. Explain to them why you can't. Could be that's just too much detail on top. Okay, you might be able to get everything. That's going to bring down your reliability. If coach says, I don't mind the reliability going down as long as we have this, then that's okay. But you need to have that conversation with them. Okay? Halftime. So again, halftime scenario. Ensure the information is factual. So again, that's coming back to us not having too much information. What we've had in the past is we've loaded information to give to managers and players at halftime, but we overload them. Okay. We have all that information. After the game, we go back, double check it. It's not right. We've tracked too much. So we have to make sure it's, inf it's factual information. Two to three main points. Okay, so players don't want to take on five, six teams. They want two to three main points in our first half. A lot of the time, the players are going to be seeing it anyway, because usually the players are on board in this analysis process. So they'll see it themselves, and you're just giving them information to back up their points. The big thing here is do not overload them. Okay? A great thing I've used in the past is a flip chart. Put up in the dressing room at halftime, write up the information on the board. It's quite easy to do that then. What that does is when you have the information up on the board, it's quite easy then for your players to see that. So again, if we're coming from our frequency tables, where we've done our frequency tables and that's the system we're using to notate the game, again, we can write that up at halftime on the board. So what that does is players who are in their own little moment there at halftime, when you come in, when the manager could be outside in the hallway and you're given the two to three points, Write them up on the board. When the players are ready, they might take on that. They'll take on that information. Okay. Again, they might be able to process, okay, we've lost six out of 15 puckers. Now, right, round the breaks. They'll start making up their own. They'll start coming, putting their own fixes to the problems they're having. All right. Again, the man comes in and reinforces that. So what half them is really important. Do not overload the information. An easy thing, I think that start doing a lot more lately, is, I know this is an example of a football game, but here's just an example how teams set up for kickouts uh, in kickout in this case. So in the modern game, kickouts and puckouts become so important. And everyone wants to know how teams are setting up for kickouts, how teams are setting up for puckouts. It's a hard thing to explain. I find it very hard to go, like, this is how they're setting up. So I think I've started doing this year is just taking a little picture of it. Half time, right, okay. This is a setup for how to set up for kickouts or puckouts from a free. This is how to set up for play. You'll see this bit of a pattern there. And at least then it gives the coach a chance to understand it. Instead of me going, right, okay, this is what it is. It gives them a visual explanation. And they can make it out for themselves then. So again, it's quite easy to do. Phone, tablet. In some case, you might bring an iPad. Just take a quick picture of it. 
have it there at halftime, zoom in on it, and players can see it, the manager can see it. Paints its own picture for us. Again, a quite easy tool for us to use. We do it in between and get back to our rotation system. Okay. Post game. So our post game analysis. Avoid giving as part of a team talk after game to avoid motion to emotion taking over. So we're talking about here is don't use your analysis post game because what can happen is we lost six out of fifteen pokeouts. What happened there? We got clean up pokeouts. Names start being mentioned. Players' names are numbers start being mentioned, and it starts it creates this us versus them attitude, or it's your fault attitude. It starts the blame game. So there's no need to do it straight after a game. We might find out that afterwards, six was being left isolated for puckouts. So then all of a sudden, we're after blaming six post game in the dressing room. It wasn't six fault at all. He had a good move, maybe that by 11 the person in the market, or the players around didn't get around for a break. Okay, so we can see why we'd avoid using it as a post game talk. We talk about using it as post game in your training to form part of your discussion. Okay. So again, we might have puck outs. Games at the weekend, we've seen some, some of the teams getting seven, eight points in their puck outs. So on Monday morning for the opposition there, it's right. Why did they get the eight points? How did they get the eight points from the get from their puck? How did they get the eight points from the puck outs? So we're looking at here, right? Okay, eight points from puck outs. Was there a certain pattern that they did? was that we weren't strong enough from breaks. So now we can start creating that discussion and how we're going to work on it going forward, okay? Charts can be posted around the dresser. So we'll show a little examples of that in a minute. So we can post our KPIs or what we think is important to us on the board around the dresser, on pictures around the dresser. Again, the player's gonna be involved in this process. So we're gonna have their certain targets they want to achieve for shooting. We will have certain targets they want to achieve for puckouts. So you can put them on the room around. Okay, and a report could be sent out to players via WhatsApp. So again, putting something into Word, putting a bit, few key points into Microsoft Word, type it out, putting our charts in, and send to players to Microsoft Word after the game. So again, our information from our template, placing it into Microsoft Word, creating a bit of a template, and then, or creating a bit of a report into Microsoft Word, send out to players via WhatsApp, and then they can see it before training, and let's them paint the picture. Okay, they can. See get an idea of how where the game was won and lost. So again, these are the little pictures we're talking about. So on the left one here, we see chance conversion, 62%, hooks and blocks, 18. So again, by putting the words and the targets up on the board, up on the pictures, it makes it visual for the players. It's very easy for the players then to see that and go, okay, we made 18 hooks and blocks. Our target was 25, our target was 12. We did good, we need to improve, okay? And players like to see the pictures. It makes the dressing room look nice. It makes the place feel more comfortable to walk in. And just seeing up there, they can make their own pick, they paint their own ideas of that. Again, our chance conversion of 62%, we're probably going to be happy. Whereas if it's 35, they're going, okay, right. How many chances to create? Did we take the right scoring option? So it's letting us create them messages, okay? Feedback and training. So one thing I've really found is when we're doing our meetings, in the past, they used to be after training. Everyone come in and train. They do their sit down sessions afterwards. What I like to try and do is conduct them actually before training. The reason to try to do it before training, players are more engaged before training. They come in, they do it, they come in, they're alert, they're ready for the training session. They're seeing what's going up on the board. They're not waiting to get home. They're not waiting to get dinner into them. They're coming in, they're ready. Big positive from doing before training is it gives players a chance to work in the areas discussed instead of having to wait to the next session. So we always see, well, usually in our analysis sessions, there's always one or two work-ons, okay, or things to improve. If we're doing that at the end of training, the players aren't getting a chance to practice that. They have to wait till Thursday night, they have to wait till the next session. Whereas if we do it before training, it gives a great focus on that, especially if us as coaches, we plan to work on that. It gives a great focus to the session. Now all of a sudden the players have seen the puck outs and they're going to go in for 10 minutes. They have a 10 minute focus session or an ad session which is going to be on puck outs. They're now focused to see what they have to improve on. The work ons are right there in front of them. 
So that's why I think it's a it's beneficial for the coaches because it brings more focus to the session. Your players are more engaged, and it gives the players a great chance to implement what they've seen. Okay, so I'd always recommend doing the feedback before training. So this just a little diagram on how we this just a little diagram on ways we can give group feedback at training. Okay. So you see here in my yellow dots, we have our coach led and our player led stuff. So our coach session, a coach led session, could be our focus session, so we just discussed there. Could be on puck outs, could be on opposition. A lot of this focus sessions would be opposition analysis, okay? So in some cases, it might end, this might end, um, be for everyone. Okay, so our focus should be an hour long coach led. Again, we're focusing on Opposition here, we could be focused on our own stuff. Something that's come into the game a lot lately, I've seen a lot of really good coaches implement these little stand-up sessions. Where they come in, there might be a couple of clips of your video, could be a couple of stats on puckouts, for example. So there are stand-up sessions. The stand-up sessions, everyone comes into the room, they're standing up, there's a projector, there's whatever. It's a 10-minute session. It brings a huge, huge emphasis to our training session. So the stand-up session will have a topic. Could be puck outs, could be line balls, could be seeing a certain play in a line ball. So on our stand-up session, we're coming in, huge emphasis on the line ball. 10 minutes, no more, players are in, they're standing up and they're out the pitch and they're working on that. So they go from the warm-up to wherever that emphasis was. Okay, so it's giving a huge priority on that for the session. Again, the new thing I've seen a lot of lately is player-led analysis. So group-led. So again, you could let it go to the group. So you give them the information, okay? Give them information in the game. Cook from that report we put into the WhatsApp group. So now all of a sudden, the players are getting that. We're letting them lead it. What went right at the weekend? What do we do well at the weekend? It might be how we use the ball. It might be how we dominate the other team's puckouts. It might be our discipline in the tackle. Okay? They're coming up with that. Again, we flip that if we want to do a self-discovery thing. If we want to do a self-discovery session, put our players into little pods. Give them a certain aspect of the game, a certain area. So it could be our puckouts. So we might have a pod deliberately looking at puckouts. Okay? Could have a pod looking specifically at our chance creation from play. So them six, maybe in the pod, will go off and look at chance creation. The next six might look at puckouts. They'd come back, you wouldn't do more than two pods in an evening, okay? Come back, they could do this away from training, they could do it at training. They come back and they present information to the team. So now what they might have is, they might have video to back it up, they might have a tactics board to back it up. They come in, they go, okay, when we played well, we've created a little load of space inside. How would we create that space? You're looking at these clips here in 11, 12 and 13 here, see 11, 12, 13 here, they've all pulled out the field of less space for 14 and 15 inside to get their shot off. Okay, great movement from that. The puck out one could be movement. But again, the players are conducting the analysis and giving it back to the squad. Again, we'll have our coaches working with our players, so it won't be just them going off and doing whatever they feel like. It'd be, again, self discovery It'd be both sides working together. Okay, it's great for the coaches as well because now all of a sudden the coach is getting an understanding of right, the players understand what we're looking for here. Okay, and we're look, they understand what we're looking for in these puckouts. They understand what we're looking for from our attack and play in general. So again, it's work in both areas. And again, a coach come in here and go, that's really good, we're doing really well here. But if we flip that, say for example, we crowd in and went wide, then does that give us more space? Does that open up more chance for us? So again, it gives the coaches a bit of a chance there to give feedback as well what I've seen done recently as well is individual led stuff so a player could be given a certain thing it could be an area from last week's performance okay where do you think we went well last week player comes up gives two or three points group then discuss but it's individual led so again that would work for certain players okay certain characters will enjoy that again it could be used for certain characters to create a leadership it could be created for it could be used for a new player coming into the panel someone young so I see that they understand, check for understanding and help bring them on as well. Okay. So individual feedback. This picture, I love this picture. 
of Gooch Cooper and Aims Smart. I think it's just a brilliant photo because it's the Gooch getting feedback in an environment where he's comfortable. He's comfortable on the pitch. Okay. A lot of times we've often done our analysis one on one with players in the dressing room and it gives them a real classroomy feel. Whereas when it's done on the pitch, that's where players are comfortable. Their back's not up, they're open for learning because that's where they've always learned. It's their, it's their comfort area. Okay? We're stepping into their zone, really. So for them, it makes them feel comfortable to take on that information. We're not challenging them, we're helping them. Okay? It's not like us versus them, it's us. Okay? It's an us thing, not me versus you type attitude. Okay? So if we can, if we're giving individual feedback, try and do it on the pitch. Okay? Try and do it if it's going to, if we have video, is it going to be video feedback or is it going to be evidence based? Is it going to be, are we putting our analysis template to use here? Okay. So we have this information. Can we base it? If we have, a, if we have an idea about a certain player or there's a certain thing we want to work on, can we create a template which then focus on that one area so we can help that player? Can we then, then when we're actually giving that feedback to the player, we have evidence. Okay, the last game, you got turned over three times. The last game, you got turned over two them times from over carrying the ball. Okay, maybe three catches. So that's an area we can work on. So we're giving that feedback going, right, instead of going with the old, the old attitude of, you got turned over three times. What were you at? It's now, you got turned over three times the other day. Twice from over carrying. Okay, so that's something we can work on. Where you bottled up, what was it? And now we can help. Whereas the old way of, you kept getting thrown over at the weekend, that's not really helping anyone. Okay, it's a kind of you versus me attitude. Okay, it's how can I help you? Are we telling or are we guiding? Okay, so are we telling the wrong or are we guiding? How can we help? Right, was it that you got bottled up? Was there no options out in front of you? Okay. Was the past, did the past you've received put you into trouble? So little things like that. So we're guiding them. We're not no more long telling we're guiding, we're helping, we're coaching, okay? So the big thing I'd say, if we're giving or using our analysis to give individual feedback, perfect, but let's try and do it on the pitch where players are comfortable. And again, it makes, naturally when we're on the pitch, we're going to be quicker. We're going to get to the key point quicker. Why? Because we don't want either of us getting cold, standing around getting cold. Whereas in the dress room, it tends to just drag on a tiny bit. So when we're on the pitch, it's nice and brief, Players are comfortable, and we can actually go and work on it then straight away. All right? Again, don't be afraid to come up with an analysis template to give that evidence-based feedback. So again, it's always coming back to that. And a great thing there with that is, that's now showing us that by creating an analysis template for a certain specific area, again, it comes back to that coaching philosophy and shows us how we can use our templates for different things and how it gives the evidence then to back it up. Okay, so us planning, it helps us plan it. So we can then see, right, and after creating this template to work on it, look at a specific area, okay, because I want to plan to work on this with a certain player. So we're using that coaching process. Gives us the evaluation, the feedback to come back to. So the last point before we end is, the big thing I've seen is, and I've been the worst person world for it at times. When we get our sheets, we throw it after the game's finished, that's it, grand Monday night, we do our review and that's it, the sheet's finished. Can we store them sheets so we can see a pattern over games? Put them into a folder. Okay, after every two or three games, take out the folder, see is there a bit of a pattern arising? Are we losing puck counts? Okay, are we not getting certain players into the game? Is our chance conversion rate at a certain rate? Are we only create a certain amount of shots per game? We can't make these conclusions after one game. Whereas if we keep our sheets or keep our templates or we store them in Microsoft Excel or store them somewhere, store this information, now all of a sudden we're making it, we're making conclusions after, after three games. Okay? Really, really powerful first. If we can store our sheets and keep that, that we're creating our, seeing our trends over three games or four games or five games, it gives us more information as coaches. Imagine knowing that over four games, we're only creating an average 18 shots a game. Okay, we might be racking up 212, 213, enough to win games. Okay, 
but we're only creating 18 shots or 19 shots. Right? Yeah, our success rate is 70% or 75%. But is, are we creating enough chances? So now all of a sudden, post game, we create 213. Yeah, we're happy with that. With 75% chance conversion rate. Yeah, we're happy with that. But over the four games, we're only creating 19, 18, or 18, 19 shots a game. So something we can improve there. So now all of a sudden we're getting something we can work on based off post over continuous amount of games. It's helping us learn the whole time. Okay. So what I'd say is get a folder, put it in there. Set up your templates that you know where the opposition were. Okay, when you know where the game's coming from. All right. And just keep that there. It's your day. It's important to you. Let it, as a coach, let it help you. All right. Let it help you plan your training sessions. Plan what you want to do for the next couple of sessions. Make your life easier. There'll be stuff jumping out in front of you on these sheets that you'll want to correct or help correct. All right. So these sheets can be as valuable for you to coach as anybody else. Okay. As soon as the game's finished or we've done that review, that isn't the end of the sheet's value or the data's value. Store it and keep it. Another great little tip just before we finish is using our analysis template post game. If we do record it, use a post game. A lot of the times what we find is we just use them for live and that's it. We can still do it afterwards. The, only, the great thing of using afterwards is we can stop and start the DVD player or we can stop and start the clip online when we're watching the game. We can stop and start. We can make sure it's home center right. Okay. So as a coach, let the template show or have your coach philosophy through it. Okay. Again, whatever you want your data to play to you, if it's visual, you have your scatter diagrams. If it's you want to read it, it could be your frequency charts. If you want to see the patterns, your sequential. Again, get your coaching philosophy influence your analysis template. Okay. Create so it can help help you. Don't just create to have generic information. Really create so you can really use it to help your coaching. Could be individual based. We just talked about there for a certain player to help them in their own performance get better. Okay, to help grow a player. Or it could be for the team. So creating that you can use that gives you information that you can use for training sessions. Okay. Thanks to me for your time and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching our Camogie Coach webinar series. And we hope that you got some insights and practical takeaway ideas that you can bring to your own coaching practice. Our final webinar of the series, Making Strength and Conditioning Simple with Louise Keane, is on Thursday, the 2nd of December. Until then, keep learning.